the first time I met Eric, we were playing a gig out in the waterfront in Camden, New Jersey. And it's an unusual gig because uh, first there's a lot of black people at the gig. Uh -huh. And it's uh, not normal for jazz. And we finished playing the gig and the people were very excited. It was the end of the gig and we were in a trailer. And I looked out the trailer and I could see a kid standing there like he wanted to come into the trailer or he was standing behind like a, some barricades. So uh, I opened the door to the trailer and I saw him and I told the guy, yeah, let him come in. And then he came in the room and I was there and Marcus Roberts and we started to mess with him and berate him like we do all of the kids, you know, and try to uh, cuss him out or do something to shock him or make him feel like, man, what's going on? But uh, then, uh, then after that, I saw him many times. His mother would bring him to different concerts whenever we played in Philly or in, any, in the cities around, around Philly. Uh, so I always took note of him and I knew he was very serious. He was cool, you know, he, I mean, <laughs> you know, for a guy, for you, if you, when you're 12 and you're in a room with men and you know, they're 25 or 26 or whatever, and they start telling you, you know, shut up, or how, how, how do, do you know what we're talking about or the way that we talk to them or just something, what do you do? You don't care, you just kind of, you know, okay. I mean, we grew up with that because my father's a jazz musician, I was always around it. And that's the kind of the way the musicians just kind of partially teasing. Then you give them a little love, like, no, man, you know, this is the... But he, he, didn't, it, he wasn't, didn't seem to be too phased by it. He didn't care so much. Well, when I signaled for him to come in, I kind of figured, I felt something like he was a musician. You, sometimes you can feel a, a thing, you know, you don't know what it is uh, with him. And then come to find out he had perfect pitch and he was serious about the music and his family was, he, was, he grew up in the culture, like he understood. I mean, Eric has pictures of him with, with Billy Eckstein and... I mean, he, he's very, uh, very, very knowledgeable and cultured about the American culture and about the Afro-American culture, and that makes him very rare. He come backstage, and we we would talk to him. Yeah, because we knew he was a musician at that time. We remember the J Master Marcus Roberts that went over some things about playing the piano with him. So we were always kind of checking. Cats would say, "Hey, man, you've been practicing." And other guys in, around Philly knew about him, Christian McBride and Joey DeFrancesco and. So it was kind of like a conversation, because there's never, at any given time, there's never a lot of musicians, uh, of younger musicians that can play. In, in any scene, you might, if you get, man, you know, I can name almost periods in years where it'd be St. Louis and from 1985 to 87, it was like four or five kids who could play, like Peter Martin and Todd Williams and uh, Neil Kane and s certain groups come at a certain time. And uh, he was part of that kind of Camden Philly group that was Lil John Roberts, and who plays drums now, plays with Janet Jackson and different R&B gigs, and Christian McBride, who's out there playing bass and has his own band, and uh, Fareed Barron and his brother Jafar, and Eric Lewis was a part of that group of, of kids who were serious at that time in that area. Well, first, there are not a lot of kids that are strong players. Uh, there are a lot of kids who. Um, most of the times with the kids, they kind of reflect the cliches of their time. And in our time, to be a strong player is not one of the cliches. Uh, it's mainly they have like a hip hairstyle or they have like a way of talking or the few little licks they've worked out. But with Eric, he's coming from the culture, so first he's extremely intelligent. And when you're talking to him, even when I haven't heard him play, you have the sense of the depth and the magnitude of his intelligence. The things that he's interested in and the type of pointed nature of his questions makes you look at him. Then you're aware kind of just his musicality and, and the fact that he's different from other people. He has his own way, uh, idiosyncratic, but not in, a, not in a bad way, just he's himself, uh, very definite in his way. So th that kind of combination of intelligence and definite, a definite char personal characteristic is a great sign for a jazz musician. Then you couple that with being cultured too. That's a very unusual combination. So uh, before I had actually heard him play, I was always aware of him. I kept my eye out for him, like, okay, here's a guy that might be one of the ones, because it's very rare. You know, I don't remember exactly when was the first time I heard him play, but I knew that he could play. I mean, when I heard him play, of course he can play. He had technique, he had studied, he, he was aware of the music, and, and he had a uh, kind of desire to know a lot about the music. I remember he came, he got into the Manhattan School of Music and he came to my house and we would be playing and talking. And uh, it's during, during that time I started to wonder about whether 
Eric would be able to make it or not. And I don't mean make it like to be known. He could already, when he was in high school, he could play good enough to be known because most of the people who are known can't play at all. I mean, they just have some type of charisma or some little intangible thing that makes them popular. It's not really about their playing. So he could already play good enough, but whether he would be great, that's always the question for me with my young musicians that I feel have the right combination of uh, ingredients. And uh, normally between the ages of 18 and 22, the schools beat it out of them. The schools and their students and the jazz magazines, they never recover from that. I notice the kids will be 17, 18, and they'll be really great. Then by the time they're 22, they can't really, they don't have any artistic objectives. You know, they're trying to figure out how they can make some money or whatever the kids of their age group think. Or maybe they, they, they're hanging out with whatever old lady that's telling them. I mean, it's all, it's all many things that happens. You know, so many things conspire against the continuation of a deep seriousness. So with him, I had a reservation. One time I saw him and I thought, I don't know. I just, see, he was going in a, in, in, a, in a tumultuous period, like he had things on his mind. And he was unsure, like, you know, just, I, I don't know. It happens to all of us. You know, you, everybody goes through periods where, irresolute periods. And um, then I saw him later and it was like, okay. You know, he was still, still in there. And then he had another period that I remember being irresolute. Then he came up to the time in which he won the, the Monk comp competition. He came on the road with us, and then he left. He wasn't playing with us. Um, and then after that, after he left our Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, after he left our band, um, I don't think he didn't like playing in a big band or something happened. You know, It wasn't a case where, even where we sent him home, because a lot of times with the younger musicians, they come out and they get sent home. That's just a part of what happens. You have to learn some way. Then he won the Monk competition. I remember we, all, we were in rehearsal when we got the news. Everybody started cheering and screaming and hollering. And uh, from that point on, I think that uh, before he won the Monk, monk competition, he reached a, a, peri uh, a, a resolution about how he was going to develop his talent and speak to the magnitude of what he was capable of doing. And from that point till now, it's been a constant reiteration of all those basic values that he had when he was 16 or 15 or 17. And that's a very difficult thing for a man in his mid to late 20s to be able to do, to take have that same enthusiasm and feeling that you had when you were 15 and 16 and that everything was possible and for that to continue to be true. Then he was the house pianist at Cleopatra's Needle. And he went through a period of deep, deep, deep woodshed uh, that very few musicians have ever really gone through. And that's what's given him kind of the status that he has now, which is what I call kind of genius of modern piano. And I only really consider Marcus Roberts and him, of all the musicians that I've heard, to be in that category. People can play jazz of all styles who have a unique voice and a way of playing that I don't think anybody has ever played. With Eric Lewis, it's kind of the digital technique that he does with his way of syncopating things and uh, the contrapuntal way of playing and a breath of imagination, like two tremolos in different times with counter lines going on and uh, a, a conception of comping that includes things from the American fiddle tradition, different aspects of classical music, all types of American folk music, aspects of the jazz tradition from Errol Garner to James P. Johnson to Herbie Hancock to uh, Bill Evans to encyclopedic references that are correct and appropriate to the time and a rhythmic sophistication that includes Afro-Latin Afro rhythms and uh, the ability to play six and four and things in different meters. Only Eric and Marcus Roberts really that I've heard have been able to do that. Uh, in addition to having a type of understanding of the blues idiom and the church music that gives the music the type of spiritual uh, uh, attention that's required for, for greatness. I, I think that irresolute periods will uh, are always, always crop up uh, because that's what tests your seriousness and that, that's what nullifies people. That's how you get knocked out. The arts is a serious game. And it's fun because you're playing with the whole history of people, not just of your people. And uh, the, when you're trying for great things, you will be irresolute. And in, in, in eras, there's so many eras, and it's always kind of like a, 
dark era, you can always see darkness around you because you're always surrounded by that kind of darkness. In some periods, there are more lights than at other times. Um, kind of in Eric's time, his generation, it's a lot of darkness, you know. And uh, so the musicians are always tested, and they almost always fail. Um, I'd say out of maybe, in my 25 years out here, out of, I'd say a good 34, 30, 33 or 34, five up in that group, number of musicians that I thought really could be great, two or three pursued it with the type of intensity and single-mindedness that you have to pursue that type of thing. That's why it's an exclusive club. And you don't, it's not like you get an award for it. Then you just get vilified. So, you know, Eric, I, I, I kind of I marvel at him. You know, I always tell him I have tremendous respect for him, and I look at him uh, different. I have a different, different whole level of respect for him. I think the challenge for him is to document his actual plan and to have belief in it. Um, it's hard when you're the only one who believes in something that's not reflected in your culture, and you have to carry the identity and the integrity of a thing by yourself with no reward at the end of it. That's very difficult. It's not like the critical community is going to celebrate somebody who can play. They won't do that. They're going to attack you. It's not like, you know, the Afro-American is going to follow you for playing. They won't. They'll follow you if you don't play. It's not like you're going to have all kind of girlfriends rushing towards you because you're a great piano player. That's not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, it's a challenge because it, talent goes where it's rewarded, in the words of the great Frank Stewart. And... Uh, it will remain a challenge. The deeper you get into a thing, the more alone you are. And, and that loneliness, get, it gets to you, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't let up. It's like if you continue to be serious, you will continue to have that type of loneliness. Then you know, you'll get bands together and they'll break up. Then you have musicians that you cultivate and they'll leave. Then you have close friends of yours and they'll lose their integrity and make you question your own. You have records you put out and they won't sell. You'll document some really great thing that nobody's ever played and nobody will say anything about it. You'll, then you have your, all your personal problems and things that you'll deal with. There are many challenges uh, to developing and maintaining first class artistry. Uh, but at the end of the day, the fun is just to be able to do something that well and to pay that much dues to a thing and be able to manifest it, to make it be real a thing that's in your mind, and your imagination, and only you can make it be real. And for it to have that type of richness, that confluence of relationships, and for you to put that thing together, that's like a gigantic crossword puzzle of unbelievable intensity and sophistication. Then you add the soul and the depth and the whole countryness and everything, and with jazz, you're improvising with other people. It's a very, very complicated and rare thing. So you have the joy and the beauty of doing that. But if you're looking for external rewards for it, hmm.